Hallelujah and blessings in the name of Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study in the book of Galatians. We are in chapter 2, and we're going to pick up where we left off at verse 11. So if you have your Bibles in front of you, turn to Galatians chapter 2, and let's begin to read together in verse 11. Now remember, Paul is laying a foundation here as he moves into the meat of the letter, and so he's establishing himself as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, not simply a follower of Jesus, but even more so an apostle that has been sent by Jesus unto the Gentiles to proclaim this good news. Paul, understanding how rumors can spread, it appears that he's addressing a situation here that may be misunderstood by many. And I say this because in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, and he goes on to explain how this man was caught up into the third heaven and heard from the Lord Jesus himself. Now, Bible scholars and theologians have come to the belief that Paul is speaking of himself. And if Paul is speaking of himself, he is being so careful on the issue of pride that he doesn't even name himself. And if that's the case, then I don't see how Paul would take pride in the fact that he called out Peter, which is the pillar of the Christian establishment. And yet Paul says in verse 11, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And so again, I don't think Paul is making himself equal with Peter or more important than Peter. He's simply saying, look, these rumors are spreading throughout Judea throughout these regions, and I want to make the matter straight so that no one misunderstands or is confused by what took place. So he explains in the next few verses, in verse 12, he says, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Speaking of Peter, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So basically, Peter is eating with the Gentiles until the Jews come around. And when the Jews come around, he has nothing to do with the Gentiles. Now, this is causing, obviously, hurt feelings among the Gentiles, but it's also portraying not only a sense of partiality, but absolute and clear hypocrisy. Now, if this were to take place in this day and age, the first thing that you would hear is, Paul, who are you to judge? But Paul knows that it is his responsibility to make sure that the things of God are first and anyone adulterating or compromising that message is to be called out. And so Paul calls him out. He says in verse 13, the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. And what's hidden beneath this text is that all these followers are following Peter's lead. And that's the danger. If Peter was alone in this situation, Paul might have handled it differently. But because others are looking to Peter for guidance and as a role model, Paul understands it's absolutely necessary that this discrepancy be pointed out. So he says in verse 14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, that there is neither male nor female, but all are one in the Lord Jesus and are to be treated the same regardless of race, color, creed, or nationality. And so Paul goes on to say, I said unto Peter before them all, he didn't take Peter aside privately, which is the way the Lord Jesus said it should be done. He says, I stood Peter up before them all. Now, maybe the reason he did this is because Peter was looked to as the leader of them all. And so he says unto Peter before them all, if you are a Jew living after the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? 
The Gentiles need to live according to what we have told them and what you have told them. Jews aren't supposed to live as Gentiles. Gentiles aren't supposed to live as Jews. He says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, in this faith isn't just a simple belief, but it is an observance to the things that Jesus commanded. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, which means if you're not obeying his commandments, by your very actions, you prove that you do not love him. And so Paul says, we are established by the faith of Jesus Christ, not by the law. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Again, are works important? Absolutely. Are they a condition to your salvation? Absolutely not. And so many of the Jewish people believed you had to incorporate works to be saved. And the Christian faith says, if you are saved, you will incorporate works. But it's done out of desire, not duty. And he finishes verse 16 by saying, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. In other words, Jesus accepts us and offers us his mercy because he understands our humanity. And strive as we may to live above all aspects of sin. Not the things that we would practice and premeditate, but the thoughts that we may sometimes have, the attitudes that we may sometimes have. All of these fall into the category of sin. And so because we are sinners saved by grace, striving for perfection in Christ, it doesn't mean because of his mercy and his grace that he offers us a badge to sin. You see, that's what's wrong with the Roman Catholic confessional. You come in, you make your confession, you go out, you live your life, you practice these sinful ways, you come back in, you make your confession. That's not to be. God forbid, Paul says, if we've truly been delivered of our sin and we are truly sorry for our sin, we will do everything in our power to ensure that we do not continue in that sin. That's why Paul says in verse 18, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For through the law, I'm dead to the law that I might live unto God. I have been crucified with Christ. A part of me died when I met Jesus and I determined to follow him. Nevertheless, the part that lives in me isn't me. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by obedience and faith unto the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so he says in verse 21, I do not want to frustrate the grace of God. I don't want you to be confused by what I'm trying to tell you. For if righteousness comes by the law, if your acceptance unto God the Most High comes through obeying the law, then Christ died in vain. We're not accepted by what we do is what Paul's saying. We're accepted because of what Jesus did for us. And that's why he says in chapter 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, tricked you into thinking that you should not obey the truth? The message is very clear and the message is very simple. If you are in a relationship with a husband or a wife and the only times that you do things for them is because you are obeying a structured set of laws set down by them, there is no passion. There is no life. There is no spontaneity in the relationship. Therefore, that relationship is dead. But if you truly love someone, you're going to go out of your way to do things for them that bring them pleasure. Your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is no different. That's what Paul is saying. And he's saying that to the Galatian church 2,000 years ago. 
And the Holy Spirit, through the writing of Paul, is saying that to us today. When you wake up in the morning, are you passionately in love with Jesus? Or are you simply following a set of laws that make you feel comfortable, that ease your conscience in thinking that you have found favor with God because you are obeying these certain deeds, paying your tithes, going to church, reading your Bible, praying? Are all of those things important? Absolutely. But where do they fall in the list of priorities? Do they come from the love in your heart for Jesus? Or are they simply acts of obedience that you feel like you must carry out? That's the difference, and that's what Paul is trying to get us to see here. Well, friends, we're going to end there today. We'll pick up in chapter 3 next time we're together. Again, if you have any questions about anything that's discussed in these videos, feel free to leave me a comment below, and I'll be sure to both answer your question in writing and, and possibly in the next video the next time that we're together. Now, before we end, friends, I want to be a little bit transparent with you because I got to tell you, if you're feeling a little confused by these teachings, that the fine line that runs between grace and obedience is so blurred at times, it's hard to know what to do. I'm right there with you. And I guess it all boils down to motive. When we do things for the Lord, are we doing things to earn his favor are we doing things to earn his reward or are we simply doing them because that's what's in us? That's what's springing forth from us. I can remember a few occasions when working, someone patted me on the back for doing a good job. And yet my response was, I'm simply doing my job. I don't deserve any special recognition I don't deserve a bonus or a raise. I'm only doing what, what I have been taught and told to do. And that's how we must approach this teaching. We are Christians, follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're only doing what he has commanded us to do. Reading our Bible, praying, going to fellowship, serving others. We don't deserve any special commendation for these things. We don't deserve a gold medal and any recognition that we do receive for the things that we do are simply to be laid at his feet because he is the one that is worthy. That's what Paul means in verse 20. It's not me that is doing these things. It's Christ in me because before I became one with Christ, I didn't do these things. It's only because of Christ I serve others. It's only because of Christ I have a desire to read his word. It's only because of Christ I have a desire to fellowship with him and communicate with him in prayer. And I have to remind myself often, and I would encourage you to do the same, that I have the Father's favor because of what Jesus has done for me. Nothing I do is deserving of his praise. Only what Jesus has done for me. The last thing that I'll say on this subject before we close is this. The reason that these things are so difficult for us to understand is that we don't see them as children. We see them through our complex adult minds. And so the reason that these messages, that these revelations are so difficult for us is because we're making them much too complicated. We must think as children in the simplicity of the truth in order to understand these very basic elemental teachings that we find here. Well, I love you, friends. Now, as Yahweh wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.